Have you heard of big data before? Do you know how it's going to be used to shape the future of education? Stick around and let's see if we can explain that to you. Hello, my name is Hussam al Daman. I would like to welcome you to this episode that talks about big data and how it's going to shape the future of education. Today's episode is based on an article that was published in Review of Research and Education in 2020 by Fisher et al. Effectively, this paper was actually written by nine different people, which makes it a very interesting uh, paper because it provides expertise from various places. Let's begin by uh, talking about what is big data. Big data, it differs from your regular data because it comes from large volumes. It comes from many different places, yet at the same time, it comes in a very speedy manner. The paper talks about the root of big data coming now in education, coming from two specific places. One, student information system or SIS. Now this includes items such as academic backgrounds for students, their status in terms of where are they in the program, their performance, and along with demographics. Also, big data in education comes from learning management systems, LMS, like Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle. They provide us with information about students' behavior. Uh, this is information that is difficult to obtain through face-to-face -face interaction, but they provide us with something that is really critical, which is timed, stamped logs, which could be used as data points. Uh, it's important to know that big data has three different levels. Level one is called micro level, which is a uh, click stream data. Uh, this is where we talk about interaction of individuals in their learning environment. And now we're talking about MOOCs, we're talking about simulations, intelligent tutoring systems, games. So this is where we obtain information from the click stream of the interaction that is uh, generated by the students. Secondly, something called meso level or text data. This is where we look at the learners writing in a digital setting. Of course, this was not possible before, but now because we're using things like discussion forums, online assignments, social media interactions, so we can take whatever the students have written and analyze that and make that into big data. The third level is a macro level. Now, this is where we're talking about institutional data. This is where we're talking about the learner's demographics, uh, admission data, class schedules, enrollments, term grades. Uh, this is a, you know, data that is available on a macro level. Of course, there's overlapping between the three, and we'll talk more about that later in the video. Uh, the paper, what it does, it actually reviews multiple papers in the past and it synthesizes them and it takes the information and it actually provides us with the summaries. Now, uh, this article focused on uh, 370 papers that, that looked at micro level uh, uh, big data, 175 papers that looked at meso level and 57 papers that looked at the micro level. Let's begin with the micro level data. Now this data gives us insight regarding the learner's actions. Now this is important because uh, this gives us information about how students uh, uh, interact online. Uh, however, what's important about this is that we don't need a large number of students to obtain this kind of data. One single student could generate hundreds if not thousands of data points. Just think of a student and how they interact online, how many times they click, how many times they preview a particular course, how many times they see a video. All of these different interactions are actually tabulated and recorded, and this is where we get that information. So if you take that and you multiply that by 100 students, 200 students, and now you have a huge amount of data that which we call micro-level big data. Uh, for this particular um, information, we're talking really about something called self regulated learning. We're really trying to understand how students are learning and we're trying to get this information in real time. The paper divides this level into six different uh, components. The first component is known as knowledge component. Now this is where uh, we're trying to identify um, how performance relates to complex 
cognitive skills. The paper talks about using automated de detectors uh, to show how students uh, interact and how they transfer knowledge from one domain to the next. Instructors could use this data, of course, to scale up or scale down student learning. The second component that was talked about was something called metacognition and self-regulation. Now, this information uh, is obtained through LMS, learning management systems like Blackboard or MOOCs. Now, this is where we're trying to understand the students previewing and reviewing of course materials. Now, we're talking about how they are going to manage their time and their tendency to procrastinate. The third component that was discussed in this paper was something called identifying affective states. Now, this is where we get information that helps instructors understand non-cognitive constructs that are related to engagement, uh, motivation, uh, affect. Examples of this could include things like sensor-based and interaction-based detectors by using facial expressions and hand movements. These detectors could reveal information about frustration or uh, the drop of interest in the students uh, when they, uh, of course, are interacting online. The fourth level that was discussed in the paper, uh, of course, which is perhaps uh, the most important, which is identifying um, and evaluating student knowledge. Now, this is, of course, also known as knowledge inference or latent knowledge estimation. So we're trying to understand how students um, try to analyze particular problems that are giving online. The fifth level talks about um, data being used as actionable knowledge. Now, this is where um, it's closely monitored by administration so that they can actually find out exactly how um, uh, there could be certain interventions uh, for students. So, for example, we're trying to detect how students become disengaged from online courses, or we could use uh, detectors uh, as the basis uh, for uh, intervention to find out exactly how we can improve student uh, engagement and motivation. The last level or the last component, this is where big data is used to cluster information so that we can actually get as much data as we can and then understand how we can try to personalize that data and try to help each student on an individual level. The paper moves on to talk about meso level big data. This is where we have witnessed a shift in writing from paper to the digital domain. Now, because students are writing in various um, places online, for example, uh, through LMS or through social media, we can actually find information about how students understand the topics through their writing. So we can use linguistic tools to identify lexical or syntax features in student writing. Now, this is really important because students are writing not just through LMS, but also through social media, so we can actually obtain information from there as well. Now, the paper divides this level into four different components, cognitive, social, behavioral, and affective. Let's begin with the cognitive. Now, this is where they're saying we're trying to support and evaluate cognitive function through this kind of data. Now, the focus here is on supporting and assessing students' cognitive function, knowledge, and skills. Uh, uh, this is done by offering, of course, uh, information about automated student feedback and automated student uh, grading. So this is where we're trying to help uh, faculty members in grading essay papers uh, through the information that's provided by this kind of big data. The other level that they've talked about or component is supporting and examining social processes. Now, when we talk about social processes, we say that it stems from online dialogue and discussion patterns. These are related, of course, to things that they write in discussion boards, intelligent tutoring systems, uh, transcripts of videos. So this information is really critical because it uh, provides us with information on the social interaction between students and, of course, their instructor. The third level that was talked about, or the third component, is detecting behavioral engagement. Now, this is related to the student's course engagement and resource-seeking behavior. So, for example, students that view lecture videos, sometimes they pause, sometimes they fast forward, sometimes they rewind. So we try to understand exactly what, what is this related to their behavior? How is this all tied to the way that they're um, understanding the course material? 
The uh, last level that was discussed is something called examining effective constructs. Now, this deals with the learner's self-concept uh, uh, and sentiment, motivation, and how they engage in learning activities. An example would be the learner's feeling about the course. Um, uh, how are they finding uh, this course? Are they um, feeling that this is uh, something that is too much for them? Is this going to impact the dropout rate in this course? So this is really critical, important uh, information that gives us uh, an idea about the learner's self-concept. The last level of data is called macro-level data. Now, this is da data that is not often updated, so this is information that is obtained on yearly or maybe semesterly basis often used uh, uh, for early warning systems, uh, course guidance and information system that is also obtained through this, gives the administrators information about how to uh, deal with the students and how to understand the students. Let's talk about the different levels that are included under this particular um, categorization of big data, which is the micro level. First of all, we're talking here about institutional data, which includes student demographics, their admission data, enrollment, grades. Uh, this is information, of course, as we've mentioned, is not updated quite often. However, it is really critical, of course, when it's combined with the other levels of data as we discussed at the beginning of the video. So this is really important where we take a look at student demographics and their behavior, or student dem demographics and their writing and what, what they're trying to convey. Their admission data and their enrollment, their past grades, this is all critical information that is really important for the instructors. Um, another really uh, critical uh, importance here is looking at the early warning systems that is provided by this particular big data. So institutional big data could be utilized to construct a pre preemptive uh, early warning system. So this gives us an idea if students are on the cusp of failing, or if, the, if the faculty member needs to intervene so that they can understand exactly what the student uh, is facing. Um, this is also important because it gives us course guidance. This kind of level of data gives us course guidance so we can look at past information to understand how the student could behave in the future, to understand if they're able to complete their degrees and if they're eligible to graduate and if there is an intervention that is needed so that we can actually step in and say to the student, well, based on your past records, it seems like you are facing certain issues. Um, there's also an administrative component here that talks about the relationship between the institution and the students. So again, we're trying to uh, have information that could provide valuable insight uh, into the institution's overall education environment. So we're trying to assess the institution as a whole, not just the uh, student. Of course, there are challenges with big data. Three kinds of challenges were mentioned in this paper. Number one. Uh, accessing this data, number two, analyzing this data, and number three, using this data to make decisions. Let's begin with accessing big data. Big data comes from platforms sometimes that were not designed for this kind of research. As we said, the origins of big data comes from student information systems and from LMS. Information that was embedded there was never meant to be researchable. So there are certain challenges of obtaining information from sources that were never designed to provide us with that kind of information. The second thing that is really important that we need to talk about here are the privacy issues. So uh, educators and parents could be concerned with the way that this kind of data could be used. So it's important that we are not going to be using this information for any marketing campaigns, for stereotyping or profiling students. So this, there, this is a huge uh, uh, issue now that, is neat, that, that needs to be, of course, discussed and taken into account. Now we'd like to talk about analyzing big data. Big data requires certain research skills that are not abundantly available. Even if those skills are available, there are certain issues with error rates and noise. But let me go back to the skills that are needed. Um, analyzing big data requires certain knowledge of software and analysis, which of course is not uh, available with many of us. When it comes to using big data, there's huge conflict between explaining and predicting. So for example, big data could uh, help explain a phenomena, but it might not help in predicting its future occurrence. 
and there's also the possibility of bias that needs to be taken into account. Now, in terms of recommendation, the paper offers the following. It says, number one, there has to be emphasis that needs to be placed on providing training on how we, of course, again, obtain, uh, analyze, and use big data. And this has to begin at, at the graduate level in universities. And there might be a need for interdisciplinary training between education and computer or data sciences.